This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 166 was recorded on May 9th, 2019. I'm Eric Townsend. Equity market volatility is back with a vengeance this week, so it's time to bring out the big guns. Nomura's Charlie McElligot joins me as this week's feature interview guest. We'll discuss the equity market situation, where Nomura's CTA model shows the key pivot levels, and much, much more. The first episode of our new Macro Voices Energy Week podcast aired this week, and we'll have more Macro Voices All-Stars interviews coming your way starting next week. So be sure to stay tuned to your Macro Voices feed for a whole bunch of exciting new content that we have planned in addition to the Thursday night podcast. After processing a ton of listener feedback and much contemplation, we're now focusing on a slightly different business model that I described last week. I'm really proud to have brought you Macro Voices completely free of charge for the last three years, and we don't want to give up that heritage. So we're going to try as hard as we possibly can to keep all Macro Voices content, both the original Thursday night podcast and all of the new premium content, completely free of charge to the listener indefinitely. Folks, there's only one way we can achieve that goal, and that's with your help. To keep Macro Voices free, we need to secure corporate sponsorship for all the new content. We know you don't want to hear screaming announcers pitching their wares on Macro Voices, and neither do we. So we're going to focus on sponsors that will be satisfied with a short, tasteful message acknowledging their sponsorship. Here's my elevator pitch to prospective sponsors. Wall Street Week with Louis Rukeyser was made possible by funding from MFS, providing mutual fund services to institutional investors. Look, folks, I just recited that line from memory, and it was at least 35 years ago that I used to hear that one line repeated just once every single week. So that kind of tasteful, understated marketing message really does work. And I would further argue that the Macro Voices audience would be far more receptive to that style than to conventional ad spots where professional announcers scream at the top of their lungs, hard-selling variable annuities. So we're going to try and be selective and only take on sponsors whose services you might actually want to learn about. But we can't be that selective without your help, folks. Podcasts are a dirty word in most marketing departments because there's literally thousands of them. Some of them run by 16-year-olds in many cases. So that's the image that comes to their minds when they hear the word podcast. For those of you who work for companies that would make good sponsors for Macro Voices or who know someone that does, we need your personal help making this happen. We need you to get your marketing director's attention and tell them that Macro Voices is worth sponsoring. They need to hear from you that Macro Voices is something that smart people with money actually listen to every single week. That's what they need to hear, and they need to hear it from someone they trust. So please, do your part to help us secure sponsors whose products and services might actually interest our audience. We want to expand the Macro Voices brand to bring you even more premium content, including a new show that will feature two hedge fund portfolio managers and two boutique class institutional investment advisors talking shop about actionable macro trading strategies in the marketplace. It's called Inside the Investment Committee, and you won't find anything like it anywhere else. And we want to give it away free of charge to our listeners, along with all of our other content. But we obviously can't do this without funding. There are only two choices here, folks, sponsorship or a paid subscription model. Let's save the paid subscription model as an absolute last resort. Sponsorship inquiries should be sent to info at macrovoices.com. And it's up to you, our listeners, to get prospective sponsors to send us that email. Think of the time you invest in making that happen is doing your part to save all of us from a paid subscriber model. We can do it and we can create an absolutely amazing free financial media source, but we can't do it without your help. Thanks for your patience with the long-winded opening monologue this week. Now let's get right to the markets because it's been a hell of a week.
And I'm Patrick Ceresno. Now, Eric, you're absolutely right. It's been a hell of a week. I mean, what a change from last week to this week's episode. The S&P 500 certainly has uh, gone a little bit of a roller coaster ride. What's your take on this? Well, you know, after being so bearish in my outlook, I'm sure most of our listeners are expecting me to say, okay, this is the big one. You know, the S&P is rolling over. It's all over. We're headed, to, you know, to the 1500 from here. Um, I don't think so. I think that as much as we still have major, major problems, none of the problems that led to 2008 have been solved. We've got trillions of dollars of negative yielding debt around the world. We're late cycle dynamics. Every place you look, we're seeing recession signals. But you know what? The market is not getting spooked by any of those things, even as much as I think it should be. The reason the market is spooked this week is because of this trade deal with China. And I think this is Donald Trump art of the deal negotiating game. Uh, I think there's just too much at stake for both leaders here not to let this deal happen. And I think what we're seeing is the saber rattling. They want to show their constituents that they're tough players or, or, or what have you. And I'm very much informed by the wisdom that Pippa Malmgren shared with us on this when she said, look, traders want to think that everything's about us, that it's all about markets and finance. There's a lot more at stake than just the stock market for Donald Trump and for Xi. This is a, a really big deal. It's going to define the way these leaders are remembered. And I think they both have a lot invested in making a deal happen. Now, if it really and truly falls apart completely, sure, that could be the catalyst that leads to what I've been waiting for, which is for this market to finally roll over and to enter a serious bear market. Market. But frankly, I, I don't see this playing out this way. I think that what's more likely is that we're going to go through some fireworks and some gyrations, and eventually it's going to play out to be a big bear trap. Now, I don't think the market should be recovering with all of those other fundamental reasons for it not to be. But I, I think what's going to happen is this trade thing is going to blow over, and we're probably going to see a full retrace and maybe even new all-time highs. So I'm happily on the sidelines here. I'm definitely going to ask Charlie McElligot whether he agrees with my view that this could be a bear trap and how he's playing it. So look for that in the feature interview. Meantime, we're going to have a full chart book in postgame. So be sure to stick around for the postgame segment after the interview with Charlie when we'll go into full detail. And Patrick, I have to assume that you and your big picture trading members are doing fantastically well on your straddle trade because needless to say, we've seen a blow up in the VIX and that's got to just work in your favor if you're trading that straddle. Are you guys taking profits on this? Are you going to just ride it? What, what do you see here? Well, we're certainly not taking profits on it, but uh, we did do an adjusting trade. Actually, it's been working out perfectly. I mean, we rolled up and had um, the straddle up at the top end of the S&P range. And so with this drop, we've had this amazing opportunity to to roll down the call. And I guess it's not called a straddle anymore when you do that, but we've basically locked in this intrinsic value, creating this beautiful asymmetric scenario where at this stage, if the market decides to tank in a big way, we're, we're going to have lots of of exposure to the downside, but at the same time, we're going to lose very little if this was to explode higher, and we're not at risk of being stopped out. So I, I love our position. You're going to pretty much need a crowbar to take it out of my arms. Well, congratulations then to you and all of your big picture trading members. Oh, it's not a guaranteed profit yet, but it's a great position to be in. Nonetheless, uh, let's move on to the dollar because I would have thought with all of this chaos occurring that the dollar would have done something, either higher or lower, with a little more gusto. Now, we talked last week in the chart book about how the emerging markets are breaking down, but it's certainly not manifesting in the dollar index. What's your thinking here? No, you know, the dollar index chart to me, if I look at it in isolation, still looks reasonably healthy to me. We're not seeing the breakout that I expected to the upside after closing above 97.50. But at the same time, the small pullback we've seen is not giving me any reason to get, you know, outright bearish either. I, I think that we're seeing this market not break out as quickly as I had originally expected, but I don't see any reason to turn bearish. The one thing I would say is the dollar yen 
again, if we look underneath the dollar index at the dollar euro, which is the most important pair, and the other dollar pairs that make up the dollar index, dollar yen chart is not looking great. So if I was uh, looking for a reason to be bearish, I wouldn't be yet, but I would be watching the dollar yen chart carefully in case it's a sign of further weakness to come. But uh, I, I really think that you know what we're seeing is more consolidation. I, I definitely do take pause because I thought that breaking 97.50 to the upside was going to beget more buying and that we would see a self-reinforcing virtuous cycle that would take us closer to 100 on the dollar index. That didn't happen. So that causes me to reflect on, on the view that I've had and why I've had it. But I definitely don't see any reason to be bearish yet. All right. Well, let's move on to crude oil because crude's been relatively weak, but it's not exactly accelerating to the downside. We're still north of $60 on WTI. What's your thinking here on crude? Patrick, I'm going to start with a quick housekeeping note, which is we always welcome our listener feedback. Twitter is the best place to make that feedback about the format of this show. We just launched Macro Voices Energy Week, which is a full-length podcast entirely about the energy market. So our listeners that are interested have already heard that and maybe don't want to hear my full-length crude oil report. So I'm going to try to shorten the weekly crude oil reports up now that we have a podcast dedicated to the topic. But uh, I certainly welcome feedback on that. But let's come back to the actual crude market, Patrick. It's a mixed picture. You know, we, we've seen some downside, but so far that 200-day moving average is holding pretty well. Both WTI and our Bob Gasoline are flirting with their short-term moving averages, but this time they're testing them as resistance, where they had just broken through them as support a little over a week ago. My bearish view was based on a trend, Patrick, of bearish inventory reports. Five of the past six weeks' inventory reports were unexpected builds on inventory, a bearish signal, and I thought that that trend was the reason to expect further price downside. One week does not make a trend, but this week's inventory number was a surprise in the other direction. EIA reporting a drawdown, not a build, but a drawdown of 4 million barrels versus API having reported a 2.8 million barrel build, and the consensus expectation was for about a 1.9 million barrel build. Cushing, Oklahoma was able to print a build of 821,000 barrels. Gasoline drawing down 596,000 barrels, distillates drawing drawing down 159,000 barrels. Now, this was obviously a very bullish report, a great big drawdown in crude oil, along with drawdowns in finished products in a week where everybody was expecting a build on crude oil inventories. But still, the immediate tape action was fairly muted given the extent of that bullish surprise. U.S. production ticked down by 100,000 barrels to 12.2 million barrels. Remember, 12.3 million barrels last week was an all-time record high. So we're only just one tick below that. Imports 6.7 million barrels per day, 46.9 million barrels on the week. Exports 2.3 million barrels per day or 16.3 million barrels on the week. Again, one week does not make a trend, but this certainly was the first inventory report that gave us a very bullish signal. A daily close over 63 spot 30 would probably terminate the bearish bias that I've had, but there's also a chance that we could reject the short-term moving averages and go much lower. I think this will be news flow driven, Patrick. If a trade deal really collapses completely, we find out next week that it just ain't going to happen, it's all forgotten, and it's never going to be resurrected, well, then both stocks and crude oil are heading dramatically lower. I think the more likely scenario, though, Patrick, is that a trade deal does eventually come together, even if there's a little bit of drama and made-for-public-consumption uh, you know, antics that go on between now and then. And I think that may be what it takes in order to break crude oil out of this move lower, and we might even go back and test the high if we get a resolution that's favorable in the trade deal. So I think the news flow is going to drive the market. All right. Well, Eric, I'm dying to get your uh, call here on gold, which has been pinned. Uh, I guess you can argue that uh, the dollar's also been really range bound, that it's it's not moving. But but I would have thought that we would have seen at least something more out of gold here in the last couple of weeks. But it's really kind of continues to hover around this, let's say, 1285 area. What's your take here on gold? 
Well, as I see it, the test of 1292 this week was a perfect test of the very trend line that I described on last week's show. It exactly matches the the top of the channel, so we're hitting the channel resistance line. It was rejected fairly aggressively, and there was another test that failed a little bit lower. So right now, channel resistance is holding, and it's holding in an environment where, you know, we don't know what's happening with trade and so forth. Now, certainly, if the trade deal collapses and there's a fear of maybe an escalation of this a disagreement between leaders turning into some kind of military conflict or something, gold goes through the roof to the upside, no doubt about it. But I think the more likely case is the trade deal gets resurrected, that fear comes out of the market, and then where are we? We're right on the top of the channel at a resistance line, which is being rejected already. So as we get confirmation that the trade deal really is okay after all, I would expect gold to drop from here as the dollar moves higher. All right. Well, let's move on to the 10-year Treasury yield because the yield just keeps weakening. I mean, we're almost back down to those March lows. We're still uh, around 245 here. But what do you think is the next direction here in yields? Well, we moved something like eight basis points lower just today. So we're definitely moving quickly here. The thing is, there are so many nuances to both the outright aspects of which way should either end of the curve go, and then, of course, the curve trades themselves in terms of curve steepeners and flatteners and so forth. The fundamentals are overwhelmingly complex, I think, and frankly, this is one of Charlie McElligot's top subjects. So I'm going to leave it to Charlie. Let's just suffice it to say that uh, I defer to his views. And let's go ahead and dive into the feature interview. This week's feature interview guest is Nomura's Charlie McElligot. Eric, why did we invite Charlie back this week? Well, Patrick, needless to say, volatility is back in equity markets, and we've got a very, very novel situation that traders are looking at. I don't know anybody who's better than Charlie at looking not just at the big picture fundamentals of what's going on in the economy, and he, he certainly is expert at that, but Charlie's team at Nomura is really good at looking at flows, what's going on because certain classes of traders can be expected to do certain things. And I think, Patrick, the thing that Charlie's team is best recognized for is their CTA predictive model, which basically says, okay, we know there's a whole bunch of these guys that are trading what essentially is a trend following strategy based on the price action that has occurred in the market in the past. And it gives them certain trigger levels that cause them to change what their commitment is to the market, whether they're buying or selling. It happens systematically at certain price points. What Charlie's team has done an excellent job of is building a model that predicts predicts where those price points are going to be, and they've just had incredible accuracy at predicting the level at which the S&P is either going to reverse direction or accelerate a move, and they've been incredibly reliable. So needless to say, this is a week where you want to know where those levels are. I couldn't agree more. So Eric's interview with Charlie McElligot is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is Charlie McElligot, who heads up the global cross-asset macro strategy group for Nomura and is extremely well known for the CTA model, which predicts when algorithmic traders will change their positioning. Charlie put together a fantastic slide deck in support of today's interview. Registered users can find the download link in your research roundup email. If you're not yet registered, just go to our homepage at macrovoices.com and look for the red button that says looking for the downloads next to Charlie's picture. Charlie, it's really great to have you back on the program, especially this week. There is so much to talk about that's going on tactically with moves in the market and fears about what might or might not happen with this trade deal and so forth. But why don't we start at a high level and begin with the big picture. Last time we had you on the program, 
you told us to watch carefully as to what the market did in March. You said around the beginning or middle of March, there was a risk that we might see a big sell-off if we hit certain trigger levels. We started to see that start to come true, but you also told us if we managed to get through the end of March and we still hadn't gotten closing prints below those trigger levels, that it was a setup for a melt-up. And of course, that's exactly what has happened. So in terms of the big picture, late cycle dynamics and so forth, why don't you give us an update on big picture macro landscape? And from there, we can start to go deeper into this week's tactical issues. Absolutely, Eric. I would say that the kind of the six-month worldview into March is important to set the table here because as aligned with my kind of core thesis last year was starting last summer, this view that the yield curve was going to steepen. And depending on the catalysts, it could be both a bull steepener and a bear steepener, meaning that the curve is steepening while treasuries are rallying or the curve is steepening while treasuries are selling off. I would say that the best setup for the bull steepener, which was kind of that October through March window, was the fact that my long-held view that the market smelled the slowdown into the back half of last year in the U.S., and certainly the financial conditions tightening tantrums that we went through last year. The market sniffed the slowdown before the Fed, and thus the curve began to steepen based on anticipated policy change. Not only the removal of future hikes that had been priced into the um, short-term interest rate curve, but then ultimately going all the way from removing those hikes to then pricing and easing based on the extent of both the economic slowdown and certainly the tightening of financial conditions into Q4 of last year and, frankly, into Q1 of this year. That was a a bull steepener. And that was important because this is such a a change from this kind of perpetual decade-long flattening that we've experienced that has built you know, so many of the thematic trading themes and narratives have been built around this never-ending flattening of the yield curve story. What ended up happening in March, kind of at the peak of this bull steepener, was that we had a, uh, a quick scramble of negative global growth data. And at the same time, there was a real significant kind of capitulation within the rates complex, legacy kind of bearish rates trades that were that were out there that hadn't been fully cleared out during this growth scare of Q4 and the growth scare into Q1. And that was really exacerbated, particularly, you know, we kind of hit the, the lows in, in treasury yields, uh, the highs in rates on March 27th, that that last kind of blast of of rate volatility actually was driven by convexity hedgers. So, you know, primarily mortgage-backed security, you know, types of players who uh, those are negatively convex products. So you had kind of technical factors that really created this false optic with regards to the extent of the global growth slowdown. And the crazy thing was, and thus the opportunity, was that it was happening at the perfectly wrong time, right? It was happening at the perfectly wrong time in the context that the lagging benefits of the Chinese stimulus, Chinese easing, and Chinese deregulation was really starting to kick in. And at the same time, the Fed was discussing more openly now this more pro-inflationary stance as part of their overall inflation strategy rethink. So you had this kind of setup where I saw a very long kind of capitulated into, you know, rates and treasuries positioning. You had this really long bullish view on kind of the overall treasury rates complex at a time where you had a beautiful entry point into kind of a more bearish, more pro-growth trade at the same time that you had a flurry of data coming, you know, kind of in the, in the over the next week span led by Chinese credit in new loan and and credit social financing data. And what you ended up getting over the course of the week was a massive kick down the doors, kind of positive Chinese credit and impulse set of data, new loans, shadow financing, social financing, 
big kind of China pumping credit, pumping liquidity in the system. And at, during the same time, you had announcements of property regulation easing, which I believe we've currently discussed as, as being the area that matters most to the Chinese economy with regards to all the peripheral positives based around the housing industry and how important it is for you know the Chinese economy overall. And then, so you have the Fed messaging changing on a more pro-inflationary dialogue back in our end of the universe. And what you ended up getting after you got that big Chinese credit growth data, you had a big set of uh, U.S. data, you had a big I, uh, ISM beat, I believe you had some uh, a PMI beat, you had European retail sales beat, which was, you know, Europe has just been a one-way kind of economic surprise miss. And you had some beats there. And all of a sudden, what ended up happening was this catalyst for this overshoot. And the rates market overshot. And then you had this all of a sudden awareness that, hey, you know what? We might have overshot with regards to how, how negative we are on the overall health of the global economy. And now we have to reprice growth higher. So boom, pow, April became the month of the bear steepener. And as part of that thesis, I went out that a bear steepener is my bread and butter with regards to, you know, kind of reflationary types of trades. April was pure reflation. It was it was long tips over short nominals, right? Meaning just kind of long inflation break evens. It was long value over short momentum within equities, you know, kind of synonymous, another way of saying long cyclical short defensives. And the, part of the catalyst of this whole concept was how crowded the slow inflation positioning has been as a narrative within investors. So we really wiped that out over the course of April. And then we got to last week's Fed meeting that, that changed the dynamic again and is causing a, a meaningful rethink. Let's go a little deeper on this bread and butter trade. You have written quite a bit in your daily letters over the last several months about the advantages of the curve steepener, because as you've described just now, it can play either as a bear steepener or bull steepener, and there's arguments for both. So originally, I think it was a 5s, 30s steepener that you recommended, and in one of your more recent letters in the last few weeks, I believe that you changed your positioning to be along the 2s, 10s curve. Is that still the position, and what's your outlook? How long do you see that trade continuing to uh, to be the bread and butter that it's been for you? Sure. The curve cap, which is an, an option, basically, on the shape of the yield curve, and it's it's playing swaps, has been a, a great trade, right? We, we talked about it since kind of, you know, advocating it starting last summer. The 530s cash curve has tripled kind of gone from 20 to 60, let's say. Right now I'm looking at it, it's 60.3 bips. So it's been a home run. I think part of the idea with regards to, and, and also too, we've seen a doubling in the 230s cash curve. This is, you know, the front end of the curve is more reflective of central bank policy. And clearly that has inflected after what happened in January, right? The Fed had to catch up with the market and catch up with the deteriorating data and, and deteriorating financial conditions. The long end has been stickier and harder to move. And that's really the difference kind of between the bull and the bear steepener. The long end is the part that is going to be most responsive to actual, you know, a forward view on growth and a forward view on inflation. And which is why in April you had this kind of narrative changer into the bear steepener, which really boosted that kind of long cyclical short defensives trade. And even not just short defenses, but short tech, right? Tech is a long duration asset. You know, expensive growth stocks are long duration assets because they need lower rates to justify their valuation. The twos tens kind of switcheroo was really about a more attractive entry point. And the idea that the others had participated, whereas the twos tens had not yet broken out. I think the thing here too was that I really saw a massive long accumulating in the treasury space. And the best proxy and the thing that everybody owns for that long, of course, is, you know, TY is the 10 year future. So I liked the fact that the 10 year in particular could reprice and make the twos tens more, more attractive. What I would say, Eric, that with regards to the kind of the game changer, 
even though it was a very incremental nuanced message, the game changer that was last week's Fed meeting has put this thing on ice for the near term. And that's because into extremely dovish expectations built into the market due to the Fed's own position pivot, you know, starting since January, Jerome Powell came out and spoke from a much more balanced perspective. And that balanced perspective was best exemplified by his focus on transitory inflation weakness. And that move that, you know what, we're not going to be super reactionary with regards to the inflation issue that they're having with regards to the forever kind of grinding lower inflation is a big part of what this kind of repricing of growth higher reflation type of a trade is. So he just bought some time. But in the meantime, this very profitable bull steepener of the prior six months, and then this big bear steepener. And again, all I care is that the curve is going steeper, not whether it's a bull or a bear necessarily, is kind of on ice, as I said, simply because some folks are taking money off the table, which you know, unwinding the steepener means you're going to flatten for a little bit. I think from here, to really tie this all up, it's going to come down to the Fed language as we head into their big June inflation symposium, where they're going to have to come out and crystallize where they stand on policy, as well as a second Fed-centric point, which is what they're going to do with their balance sheet as QE light, as I like to call it, begins in October as they take their mortgage-backed security reinvestments and begin buying treasuries again thus QE light. Charlie, you mentioned the Fed's inflation symposium that they're having in June. Help me understand this, because as I understand the Fed's messaging, there's absolutely no problem with inflation. They've got it all under control, but somehow they need to have a symposium all about it in June. What's going on here? So the Fed has announced a year-long review of policy. And the, the one part of the policy that matters right now And essentially, you know, coming out after that January pivot from the Fed, you know, I went out and basically said, look, the Fed has torched any misconception. They are strictly a one mandate institution now. And that's basically the mandate has become not just a one mandate around inflation, but it's become asymmetric around inflation, meaning that the lower it goes, the more reactive they're going to be with regards to cutting, with regards to trying to stimulate inflation, than the opposite, which is much less likely to hike in the event that inflation overshoots. And that's a, that's a very big deal because the language that helped really trigger so much of that April reflation phenomenon from you know, the guys that matter most. Clarita, Williams, Evans, you know, taking this message too, was the idea that the trajectory of core PCE year over year is a real concern. It's a problem. It's got to be addressed. And that's why this June symposium, it's a research symposium, is super important. One of the things actually that I think was a clue for us with regards to the future rate of where this policy is heading was that multiple speakers spoke about the potential that Nehru is below the U rate. And basically this is telling us that you need, the Fed is acknowledging that they need to run the jobs market hot and asymmetrically hot, you know, really message forward guidance wise that you are going to cut rates in the event that inflation slows more so than the opposite to stimulate inflation, to stimulate the Phillips curve. And um, this problem of the zero bound as we near the zero bound and certainly the lower bound of where we are right now. So I think that this then came out along the same time that we got the agenda for the June meeting. And about you know a third of the meeting is made up of labor discussions, labor working groups, labor research papers, which tells us then that at the same time that some Fed speakers are talking about looking at jobs as a vehicle, labor market as a vehicle to run, to try to play catch up in this inflation averaging framework that everybody has spoken about from Janet Yellen to uh, Jerome Powell himself, that then too, if you're willing to run hot through potentially cutting rates to stimulate the labor overshoot here, that that's probably where the future state will be. And at the same time too, they even began piling on with the discussion of, quote, insurance cuts, 
and Clarita specifically mentioned that into a still strong economic backdrop in 95 and 96, the Fed cut rates on weakening price pressures, right? Which is kind of similar to where we are now. And even highlighted in 98, cutting into a still strong economy on account of external factors, which was the emerging markets crisis and the long-term capital management crisis. So they really set the table for this asymmetric overall policy, far more likely to ease than the bar it would require for them to jump over to hike again. And that's a big deal when we're talking about not just the Fed June symposium, but the Fed having to update both the composition of their balance sheet into QE light, meaning that our view that they're going to be buying more bonds in the front end, which steepens the curve, which is actually a catalyst for a lot of this kind of reflationary thematic trade that we're talking about as well as you know, kind of the third point, the third leg of this stool, that China is still in no position to scale back their stimulus. In fact, and even up to the overnight data that we got, in X, any of the trade war tariff discussion, the very ugly export data again. So they're going to keep the pressure down there, which is inherently going to be um, a positive for kind of inflation sensitives, cyclicals, things of that nature. So I think that's what the, the view that I want to leave with regarding the structural stuff. Well, Charlie, I know that our listeners are dying to hear you get into the tactical outlook because it's been quite an interesting week. I can certainly say that uh, when I saw Charlie McElligot in my inbox on Sunday, I knew something was up. And sure enough, we've seen that there was a triggering of one of your CTA levels on Tuesday, I believe. So give us a rundown of how we got here and what comes next. Sure. So obviously, as the tariff news came out, you know, something that I had been increasingly aware of, you know, I love to highlight asymmetries in the market and Im- imbalances, crowding, crowding risks, especially when the, there is a narrative behind them. One of the things that I think we keep seeing with regards to some of the successes that we've had kind of capturing or flagging these directional shifts ahead of time are the convergences of, of a few different indicators. And particularly where we were last week was, you know, there was two really big observations, and frankly, recent weeks. We saw the overall scale of the market gamma position, the gamma profile in both S&P futures and SPY ETF uh, options. The combined gamma profile reached some serious extremes, both S&P, uh, SPY and Qs, you know, representing the NASDAQ side as well as as the delta in the market. And really what this was critical for me is that when I see 99th percentile, 100th percentile gamma in the market, the next thing I do, and I know that we have extreme extreme sensitivity to, to changes in underlying, let's say. From there, when I see that point in our, using our internal estimations, when the long gamma that's been built into the market, and the long gamma is built into the market because in a trending, grinding higher type of a market, generally speaking, you can assume that short volatility strategies are proliferating, are growing, more people are doing systematic roll down, more people are selling condors, more people are selling straddles, all sorts of kind of yield enhancement strategies. You can call overriding, put underwriting. You can assume that dealers are getting long gamma. The key for me, though, is where is the point that we actually inflect towards short gamma? And knowing the scale of what Trump tweeted, I knew at a, an approximation on where we, you know, calculating a flip to short gamma, which means that I think most readers know as the market goes lower, dealers are getting wrong-sided and have to actually keep selling more to maintain their hedges. So that's where you can get in a short gamma environment, get these really slippery moves. The convergence that I talked about, though, was the fact that on a gap move lower, which I knew we were going to get, kind of generically, I I finger in the air, assumed kind of a 1.5% sell-off for for the Monday, was that that gap lower was going to gap us down to where our momentum trend, CTA trend model, actually was kind of roughly anticipating the next deleveraging levels. 
And when you pile those two factors together on top of what then becomes an almost inevitable VIX curve inversion, so for all of these people that have been shorting volatility, even though there is a, an offsetting long in the VIX ETN complex, the VIX curve will invert as a lot of these roll down strategies are then forced to cover their shorts, that those three things converging and you're going to see fireworks. And that's exactly what happened Monday. There was a reason on the kind of follow through on the follow through Tuesday that we actually closed back up that we rallied, which is not for any trade talk optimism, but instead almost completely based around options related behavior, both from dealer desks, people that were long VIX ETNs, that we still had a wave of systematic deleveraging, as well as a catalyst too for a very fundamental part of the universe to sell. And that was the fact that asset managers had accumulated almost $130 billion of U.S. equity futures longs in recent months. And even in just the year to date alone, it was like $65 billion. So they finally had this catalyst to de-risk into this event risk. And boom, you get the asset managers kind of taking down this exposure. Boom, you trigger dealer negative gamma on the gap lower. Boom, you get the CTA trend to leveraging level, which in S&P did actually go from the plus 100% signal to selling down to a plus just a 60% signal. And you got the VIX curve inversion. That's how we've driven this kind of incredibly volatile two and a half session environment of the past few days. Charlie, for our listeners' benefit, I know as you're talking about the gamma, some of that's on page five and the VIX inversions on page nine. I think we may have lost a few people on the slides there. Let's go back to slide one in the deck. Why don't you talk us through how you knew that this was going to be futures driven and what you saw next and, and just talk us through the slide deck here. Right. So it was, it was this qualitative observation that for sure that we knew asset managers have gotten this trade right. They bought the dip in December. They kept loading up January, February, March, that they were going to be incentivized to take some risk off the table. So that kind of got this ball rolling. We knew that as part of that overall $130 billion of U.S. equity futures length and $65 billion just year to date alone, that that was going to drive a significant uptick in, in futures volume because that's where they held the position. Additionally, though, is this understanding, of course, that the CTA trend per our model was going to be uh, delivering. So what we looked at then was kind of this confirmation of this view where we just took a look of the percentage of notional futures uptick versus the, the overall cash notional uptick. And what it showed you was this kind of, you know, 1.3 times behavior, you know, which was the single largest uh, overshoot, let's say, of the past nine years. It was a 3Z score event, which really just confirms that yesterday was about likely confirming that this was a futures-led move and that the two real inputs here, besides the dealer gamma hedging, were the asset manager de-risking as well as the deleveraging from the CTA universe. The second slide captures exactly what I spoke about, the scale of that U.S. equity futures long from asset managers. You can see some of that accumulation, which continued all the way up until this last month, um, still buying an additional $9 billion across S&P, NASDAQ, and Russell. So you just knew they were long, and it made sense for them to take some chips off the table into this kind of risk event. The third slide, and this is, this is you know, what I know a lot of folks care about, and you know, as a word of, of caution, these are not static. These change based on both the new price levels on a daily basis, plus the uh, realized volatility profile over a trailing window. So these cannot be treated in, in static, but you can see on that kind of move, let's say from 2897, if you see that position column, the multicolored position column, you know, where we went from in the same span of two points, basically 2897 and down, we went from that 100% signal to the 60% signal. And what you can then see, if you move back left, you see that two week column and that one month column, those are the two windows of our model that flipped short. The price momentum signal for S&P lost its strength and actually flipped. So that's kind of capturing 
where the pain points were for the model. And then I think this is actually, you know, one that, that gets people very interested. And again, snapshot in time, but it's a forward look of our, of our trigger levels. You can see this dynamic where because of the environment, generally speaking, of a year ago, that as those days that were in our one-year sample look back set drop in or out of the picture, our pivot levels change. And what you see up top, that the top is S&P, the middle is NASDAQ, the bottom is Russell, is that those pivot level numbers really jump up. So what that means to me is that the pressure is going to be on to stay at this lower overall signal weight for both S&P and even NASDAQ. NASDAQ had so much wiggle room for the longest time because of the year-to-date performance and the, the explosive moves in tech. Even NASDAQ is now at risk of deleveraging, even if the market just holds sideways from here. And at the very bottom, you see that Russell is nearing uh, a point of going outright short again. And um, for what it's worth, Russell has been a great indicator with regards to kind of periods of, uh, of volatility. So that's just one to keep on the radar. Okay, so as we interpret this chart on page four, I want to remind our listeners, this is a moving target. You recalculate these numbers every day, and it depends on the tape action and what the price is. But all other factors being equal, if we just assumed a flat return right now, it looks like as we get about two or three weeks out, the market has to be above 2940 or so in order for this signal not to be triggered, which would start more selling. So do you think we're headed back up to those levels or do you think we're going to be triggering the selling before we even get to two weeks out? So it's really just about maintaining this current 60 level, let's say for the S&P as our example here. The good news is that at least from the perspective of CTAs, that for the S&P that we've already deleveraged. And the next level to actually see more selling and actually move outright short is way below the market. So to get there, we would probably need to see a pretty negative outcome into by tomorrow at midnight into Friday, the reimposition of tariffs, right? If it came out that talks had broken down, the tariffs are back on in no confusing terms, the market's going to be down 2 or 3% that next day for sure, even with this kind of next move. And then all of a sudden, that next level of deleveraging happens. I happen to believe that we understand how much Donald Trump loves the stock market as a weather vane of his kind of as a scoreboard for him. He had 500 points of S&P in his pocket since the last time he talked this up. The Reuters article today spoke to an almost disrespectful Chinese dismissal of previously agreed to terms across the boards, across all of the key talking points, that I think he has gotten their attention. And all it takes for him is to say, look, and, and for him to dictate to Lighthizer and Nuchin to a lesser extent that, hey, roll back the tariffs. Let's tell him we delay the tariffs. We're making a lot of progress in these talks. And then all of a sudden, you know, I think we're retesting our prior highs even just on the idea that we're going to keep kicking the can, we're going to keep extending and pretending to get this thing right. We just needed to get them honest and get some concessions from them again. I personally think that they will kick off the tariffs tomorrow night at midnight. I think those go through. I do think, too, they will counteract that with some language about ongoing discussions. And maybe they put a limit on those tariffs. Maybe they say, you know, we've made a lot of progress. There's a possibility that we take the tariffs off in two weeks or one month out from now. I think it's going to be a more nuanced message. And I think that's important with regards to knowing that it would take a pretty meaningful negative outcome from these events to get anywhere close to that next level of deleveraging. The one thing I would like to add, though, Eric, and I always talk about the CTAs because that's kind of been our bread and butter. And in my view, that it's not simply a discussion of commodity trading advisors, right? It's the fact that in a post-QE world, almost any trader or fund that operates under a VAR model is a de facto risk-controlled, risk-targeting, target volatility fund. And that simply means that your exposures, your leverage, your sizing is going to be dictated by the underlying volatility, realized volatility signals. So 
when I talk about these numbers and these breakpoints, I'm talking about more than just CTAs. I'm talking about kind of where the bodies lie and where things inflect and where you know, stuff becomes painful and where things can go wrong. There are other systematic strategies out there, though, that matter. And clearly, as you know, I have high confidence that on a, uh, a 1.90 handle down trade in, in a day and a half confirmed that these flows had shifted. Asset managers started deleveraging. CTAs began to delever part of their long. And then you also, too, had the VIX curve invert, which created knockoff hedging requirements, both for dealers or people short, that also you know, bleed into S&P. Another part of this are target volatility funds. And this might be a little bit wonky for readers, but you know this is almost any variable annuity. This also can overlap with CTAs with risk parity, but just to get an, uh, an understanding of what that is. And if you look at S&P indexed kind of 20-day realized, right? So a one-month look back, which is standard. And I'd also kind of generically benchmark the typical target volatility fund struck at a target volatility of 10. Right now, that 20-day realized volatility is kind of, say, nine and a half. Mechanically, though, upon crossing that 10, there will be unwinding flows. And what that requires are another few days just by staying up here in realized volatility. And you can see on the day, stocks are flat, VIX is flat. That's going to naturally drag up these trailing realized volatility levels. And that's why I still feel confident that there's probably ongoing more supply than demand type flow unless we get a positive outcome for probably just another day or two. Only after we clear any sort of downtrade around whatever happens with the tariffs into Friday, could I then want to say, hey, let's go out and take advantage of how rich volatility is. Let's go out and sell puts, or let's go out and buy some upside calls or call spreads to take advantage of what eventually becomes a deal. So I think we got to clear through some chop first, and there still is this flow out there, this deleveraging flow that's got to go through the system before we can then get that purge and, and get tactically constructive again. Okay, Charlie. So it seems like we've kind of got a dilemma here because clearly this trade negotiation is not over yet. It's not clear even after Friday and, and the deadline and who knows what happens this weekend. Come Monday, it's not going to be completely over then either. At least I strongly doubt it will be. So where does that leave us in terms of being able to put a trade on that makes sense? So I think that part of what's happening right now is that in, you know, it's, it's twofold. From a hedging perspective, you know, you still have exposure on, you're not totally flat, you're still leaning long. I personally think that euro dollar futures as a hedge, which are just a, a you know a short-term interest rate product, meaning that your kind of your long rates or your long treasuries as a de-risking hedge, still works, right? During this equity volatility spike, that risk parity-like strategy of long a low volatility asset like treasuries has done its job. Plus, you get the additional kicker that the more this tariff situation devolves, if it were to do so, the more likely that the market is gonna price in likelihood of an even more dovish Fed or even a rate hike, right? It's that same idea. Fed is cornered into an asymmetric policy. There's a much lower bar to ease than to hike. Now, from an actually kind of playing offense perspective, and it's still too early, as I just mentioned, that right now we have to see the outcome. We have to see that final purge we saw the first purge and capitulation in the VIX complex. You know, VVIX, which is volatility of volatility, was the first signal. The VIX complex went yesterday. I think any further stuff will then be the Delta One products, structured products, and things like that that were built around, you know, equities kind of volatility notes, things like that, would be the final thing to purge. And, and we talked about this potential that if you get a negative message out of this meeting, you're kind of down 2%. But I have to always look at the next move. And the next move is that right now, the market is pricing in much more crash down than crash up. And that's the opportunity, right? Upside skew is third percentile. Downside skew is 81st percentile, meaning really rich. Like people are slapping on their tail hedges. The ratio of 25 delta put to a 25 delta call is 91st percentile. 
So that's when you want to start inching closer to getting tactically offensive. And I think as it stands right now, that's probably through selling puts more so than, than calls. But when this thing turns, it's going to go and you're going to want to take advantage of this rich volatility market. I think the one thing that I want to say, and I think this is an interesting way to, to close the conversation, is that why does this keep happening, right? Why do we keep having these almost quarterly, it seems like, certainly a couple times a year, short vol, easy carry, momentum type environments, then we have a blow up, and then we have a, a V-shaped snapback. And you know the V-shaped snapback, let's say, certainly didn't materialize yet today, but that last 20-point rally in the last 15 minutes of yesterday's market was certainly that. And, and as I kind of alluded to earlier, that was guys that were long vol, whether that's retail guys, you know, that were long the VIX ETNs or, or dealers like ourselves who were sold volatility from the buy side or people that were short Delta. So short, you know, S&P futures, either as they were dynamically hedging or even people who were trying to front run the systematic trend inflection. That profit taking from those players in the last 20 minutes of yesterday was what created that big upswing in the tape. You were unwinding profitable trades. You sold some of your long volatility and you covered some of your short delta, which just bought futures. So that's why you get these like V-shaped snapbacks. But I think from a bigger kind of existential, larger level, it's what I talk about often, which is this kind of Minsky moment type of world that we live in. Stability breeds instability. And you know, if you look at the central bank playbook post the crisis, the plan has been large-scale asset purchases and providing forward guidance on lower interest rates forever and flatter curves forever. And what that's done is that it, it suppresses cross-asset volatility because it's suppressing interest rates. And ultimately, you create an intentional financial repression, which drives, as the Fed likes to call it, portfolio rebalancing as I like to call it, it's pushing people out on the risk curve, right? It's, it creates that risk for yield behavior. So why does stuff like yesterday happen? Even though these might be largely systematic strategies, it's not some HFT brainiac quant hedge fund necessarily that's the issue here. It's really, to me, it's real money institutions have moved post the crisis from being before the crisis buyers of volatility and buyers of tail risk hedges who are instead now vol sellers in this post-crisis period. As I mentioned, call overriding, put underwriting, all systematic, all rules-based, condor, strangle selling, VIX curve roll down. They're all doing this in order to generate yield in a world void of yield. And that's what's so insane about the world that we live in and the central bank you know, daisy chain where vicious cycle turns to virtuous cycle and then back again. That's why I don't see this ever stopping, frankly, because the central bank policy has dictated this market structure. And, and you know, I, I closed my note this morning with this quote. A buddy wrote it on uh, social media. It's as follows. It says, if you're short vol, you make money, but eventually die. But if you're long vol, you die before you make money. And that's kind of this current stasis that we're in right now, where you're waiting for the next shoe to drop. But in the meantime, you got to dance. You got to generate yield. You got to short volatility. You got to ride the momentum, grind higher until you know a central bank policy or uh, some sort of an, a market accident tips everything over, and, and then we start again. Okay, so to summarize, we can expect the fireworks to continue as this trade negotiation takes whatever direction it's going to take. That's probably going to induce more fear and uncertainty and pump up those put premiums even higher than they already are. That, when it's finally over, is going to be your opportunity to sell those puts and maybe go long indices and, uh, and ride the upside of this. Charlie, before I let you go, for our institutional listeners who already have a relationship with Nomura, which is the prerequisite requirement, tell them how they can get your daily letter because it's really fantastic. It's one of the best pieces of research. I read it religiously every day and very much look forward to it. So who, who's it available to and how do they get it? For sure. And I, I appreciate that, Eric. You can reach out to your Nomura sales coverage, your Nomura Securities International, Nomura Global Markets uh, sales coverage, and they can reach out and we can make that happen. There are certain regulatory dynamics with me being a desk strategist as opposed to a research analyst. 
on which domiciles I can send into, as well as revenue thresholds. We want to make sure that we are incentivizing the right client behavior, people that pay for it, get to read it and get it kind of hot off the press and get to interact with me. Um, but if those pieces are in place, make your salesperson uh, reach out and we can facilitate a dialogue. Fantastic, Charlie. We really appreciate it. And folks, please understand, Charlie's not being a jerk. He's limited by regulations and uh, factors outside of his control. Unfortunately, the letter is only available to institutional investors who already have a relationship with Nomura. Sending email to Macro Voices and asking us to give it to you won't help. Unfortunately, there's nothing that we can do about that. Charlie, we really look forward to getting you back on the program soon. Thanks so much for a fantastic interview. Patrick Ceres, and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. Macro Voices is a listener-driven program. Please email requests for specific future interview guests to requests at MacroVoices.com. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com, and we'll answer them on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. We also welcome your suggestions for how we can improve the program. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric it was great to have Charlie back on. I have so much respect for what Charlie does. For me, being any good at the markets is the study of liquidity. And for the longest time, to me, the study of liquidity was very technical driven in terms of technical analysis. But there's an important other layer to that, which can be measured very much by seeing how offside investors and traders are on any one trade. And Charlie just does such a great job with his quant work to really kind of size up where the crowding is and where the mean reversion is and what will drive it and what are the levels for those triggers. So it's always a pleasure to have them to talk about it. What did you take away from the interview? Well, I agree with everything that you just said, Patrick. You know, we talk a lot on this program about economic fundamentals and the reasons that certain conditions in the economy ought to achieve certain outcomes. And to some extent, there's always a connection between economic fundamentals and what the market is eventually going to do. But Charlie's team doesn't look at it that way. The way they look at it is, okay, let's figure out who's doing the buying and who's doing the selling and what makes them tick and what's going to cause them to change the amount of buying or selling that they're doing and predict when that's going to happen based on analyzing the behavior of the biggest participants in the market. And that clearly is what it's all about. And of course, it's driven ultimately by economic fundamentals, but understanding who the players are and what they're up to gives you a huge amount of insight and intelligence and perspective on what's most likely to happen next in the tape. So I, I just love it each time we get Charlie on, and I've certainly encouraged him now that we have the new All-Stars format, if he ever wants to come back more frequently than we get him on for his feature interviews, he knows he has a standing invitation. But Patrick, speaking of invitations, I want to invite our listeners to download yet another Patrick Ceresna chart book extraordinaire. You'll find the download link in your research roundup email. If you're not registered, just go to the homepage, look for the red button that says looking for the downloads, and uh, it should be labeled as postgame chart book. Patrick, why don't we go ahead and dive in on page two here. We see the familiar face of Jeff Gundlach, who has a look in his face thinking, I want to be on Macro Voices. I got to email those guys back and say yes. Okay, what's he really thinking? Well, you know, I, I, I thought it was great when uh, Jeffrey was uh, just on CNBC on a few days ago on May 7th. And in the interview, he basically said, just to paraphrase him, that, you know, that we're late cycle. And he's looking at everything from the perspective of the evolution of, of, of a bear market. And that's very contrary to what we're hearing. I mean, it's amazing how bipolar it is in the market. There, there's so many people that are either talking this super bull case or there's those people that are really – entrenched in the bear camp. And it's like only one side is going to prevail out of this. And I thought it was really interesting to kind of get his take on that. But he kind of looks at it and says, well, look, in the last 15 months, the market has gone nowhere. 
And so he flipped the question the other way, and he basically said, look, anybody wants uh, to say, how, how can I say it's a bear market? Uh, well, he turns around and says, well, how can you say it's a bull market? I mean, year to date, the market's up. But to characterize the last 15 months as a bull market is wrong. And so I thought that was a really interesting way to start this conversation. And the conversation I wanted to have with you is this a big topping formation and is already in the midst of a bear market? Or is this just a consolidation before the beginning and continuation of another full bull market leg? And, and this is, I think, one of the most important questions to be able to answer in the coming weeks. Maybe we don't need to necessarily know the answer right away. But what happens here? I think this is going to be an important pivot in the markets in terms of how this plays out. So what I wanted to do in the subsequent charts uh, from three, four, five, six, and seven, the next five pages, is kind of go through some of the major markets and see how they've all positioned in here and really step back on the weekly bigger picture charts and try to understand, is this a bull market or is this a bear market with a big topping formation developing? So the first chart, which is the most bullish of all, has got to be the NASDAQ. And the NASDAQ has not only broken to higher highs, for a while it held at those higher highs. And, and really, that's where a lot of the bulls turn their attention to, that there's the big momentum in these tech names is driving all of this. But really, once you start going to the S&P, and then particularly when you break it down to the New York Stock Exchange Composite Index, and then particularly even the Russell 2000, we're nowhere near making higher highs on the markets in this entire bull phase. Arguably, all you can say that the market has done is in three months wiped out 600 S&P points to the downside and in the subsequent four months rallied 600 points to bring us back to the same level we were just six months ago. So Eric, I have to ask you, what's your thinking here on this? Where do you stand on all of this? You know, great minds think alike because we're thinking about exactly the same question. And there's a big part of me that wants to say, look, it's got to be a topping pattern. Maybe it's a long extended topping pattern. Maybe it's a topping pattern that's still going to bring us more all-time highs before it's over. But if you look at what's happened since the beginning of 2018, as Jeff Gundlich says, it's definitely not a continuing bull market. Or if it's a bull market, it's at least on pause. Now, the thing is, Patrick, as much as I really want to believe that, and as much as I agree with all of our guests who have said, look, late cycle dynamics, recession signals, there's lots of reasons to have concern here. The one thing that just keeps hitting the, the back of my head is the anatomy of a bull market usually is the final phase is the blow off, the 1998 to 2000 period, where against all the smart guys in the room saying, this is crazy. These valuations don't make sense. This is not so. The market just goes straight up anyway. And eventually you get to that blow off top. And then, you know, the higher they climb, the harder they fall. You get a crash after that. We haven't really had that insane up phase. Yeah, the end of 2017 going into that early 2018 top had a lot of bullish exuberance, but it wasn't really hyperbolic, crazy blow off top. And uh, if it had been a blow off top, we wouldn't have seen the move to new all time highs. So it makes me wonder if there is still room if we do get to new all time highs, if it becomes self reinforcing, and we get a hysterical mania driven move to a blow off top. Now I say hysterical and mania driven because as far as I'm concerned, there simply is no valid fundamental reason for stocks to be as high as they already are, never mind moving higher. But if I look at how bull markets tend to end, this hasn't really looked like the ending story of most bull markets. So I wonder if there's one crazy leg higher before it's all done. You know, Eric, where I will push back on you a little bit on this scenario is going back to 2000. Now, 2000 had a blow off, but it was a tech blow off. And uh, the NASDAQ doubled in price in the final phases. But when you actually look at the S&P 500 and you see what the S&P 500 did from uh, November of 1999, it made a high, made a little bit of a higher high on March 1st of, uh, in, on March of 2000, and then just retested the high again in September of 2000. And all it ended up doing for, for 15 months was an extended topping formation. And it 
it was only the NASDAQ that blew off. And so the thing is, is that is it the expectation that the Dow and the S&P were going to do this blow off? Or is it just a, a segment of the market that, uh, that defines the hysteria, maybe the IPO market and other things that have this blow off? And maybe the, we won't see that blow off in the broader market. Well, okay, let's go back to your NASDAQ chart then on page three. Look at the what everybody who's looking at the S&P and saying it's topping, look at what it was doing at the end of 2017, beginning of 2018. Yeah, you had what looks like a perfectly normal consolidation and a very quick move, much sooner than the S&P, to new all-time highs in the middle of 2018. And yes, we saw the sell-off in the end of 2018, but already in less than the first half of 2019, you know, there we are again at a new all-time high. This last weekly candle looks pretty ugly, but, you know, we've got this trade deal thing that supposedly, at least in the public consumption version, is on the, the edge of falling apart. I think it's really theatrics more than anything else. And, you know, this, this chart doesn't look to me like it's done. I do think the valuations are crazy. I think the economic signals are all in place to say it should be ending. But uh, I, I don't see the argument that says the NASDAQ is blown off and is headed down from here. Well... You know what? I'm short and I'm staying short. So we'll see. <laughs> we'll see how it plays out. <laughs> the, uh, I mean, listen, I'm hedged. Uh, I'm in a good situation where I've got uh, the asymmetrical kind of trade where, where it's not going to hurt me badly if, um, if uh, the market rallies. But I'm, I'm positioning for this. So we're, we'll see. Time will tell uh, as to how this plays out. Now, what I wanted to touch on, let's, let's circle to chart number seven in the chart book, which uh, I wanted to just show, which was the MSCI World ETF, which is that symbol URTH. And it's interesting to note that when you look at the global market, we've seen that we have just spent the last a year and a half just consolidating some sideways in almost all global equity markets. And, and so this is not just an S&P story. And a lot of those emerging markets continue to struggle. I know a lot of European markets had a really good recovery. I know the French CAC index and a few others rallied very well. But when you look at the real broad global equity markets, they certainly aren't drinking the bull Kool-Aid. So it, you know, it really would be interesting to see whether it's the S&P and, and particularly some component of the U.S. equity market that can keep driving that. You know, maybe we should have Brent Johnson or someone come back onto the show to kind of build that narrative of, uh, you know, he, he has that milkshake theory where the U.S. equity markets will, uh, will kind of run independent of that, right? Well, Patrick, everything that I'm seeing with the one exception of I don't see that we've been through the true euphoria insanity phase that usually ends a big bull market. Everything else that I see ought to be negative. And, you know, and I think we're in late cycle dynamics. I think that we're seeing recession signals. I, I think there's lots and lots of reasons to be bearish here. What we as journalists need to do is to get more guests on the program that have an opposing view. And particularly, Patrick, one that came to my attention is John Greenwood, who is the chief economist at Invesco, who thinks that we're not in late cycle dynamics. He thinks that we're more in mid cycle dynamics. This is not 1998. This is 1995. That's the kind of viewpoint that we need to get on the program so that we can expand our horizons, because frankly, I don't see that bullish case other than the one little holdout, which is I don't think the market has gotten quite crazy enough yet for it to be finally over. But aside from that, I see no reason to be bullish. All right. Well, listen, I wanted to just on chart eight, just touch on one, a couple S&P levels just before we wrap things up here. So what's interesting to me on the S&P while we've seen like these 500 point down days on the Dow that kind of trigger this emotional, here we go again. Uh, when you really look at the technicals, we have not seen any real technical damage to the downside on the S&P. It is way too premature for any bear to be doing a victory lap. As of this moment, this, uh, this entire pullback on the S&P 500, which more or less is just over 100 S&P points, just resembles most natural market retracements. 
And so I marked off here on the S&P levels, like any sell-off that is contained to like 2,800 more or less, in my mind, would just still define this as a very natural market correction and could very easily turn bullish off that. The more bearish scenarios are if the 2,800 level on the S&P gives out, where we're going to go and test some much deeper levels that would really start to ask the question as to whether that, that high that we saw in late April, early May was in fact a major top. And so uh, I'm watching this 2,800 level. I think it's really important. The bulls need to, to kind of keep the market above there in my mind to leave the window open for another legitimate advance. Below there, I mean, uh, even those lows that were put in November and early December back in 2018, to retest those levels, they line up with some Fibonacci zones are all in that kind of 2600 to 2650 area. That would be where a, m- a much more ominous market throwback or correction would go. But I'm, I'm watching right here this 2800 level into, uh, into these tariff announcements and whether the bulls will hold the line around there. Yeah, and I think that your technical analysis jibes perfectly with the circumstances that we find ourselves in. You know, the way I look at this is if we get through this whole trade scare thing and after the weekend is over and the trade deal is back together and everything's fine, at most you got your test of 2800 or 2825 and it's uphill from there. If they screw this up and it looks like it really is falling apart next week, then maybe we get down to 2600 But I bet they pull a rabbit out of a hat and salvage the deal somehow and it eventually retrades. And certainly, if they really screw it up and they lose the deal and it's truly lost, then you could see taking out that 2600 level to the downside and anything's possible at that point. Maybe it does become the catalyst to start what I think is a long overdue cyclical bear market that that I think we have seen the beginnings of, but is just yet to play out. Patrick, I want to move on, though, to Options Education Day in Montreal, which we mentioned briefly on last week's podcast. You're going to be speaking again on Saturday, June 1st, 2019 at the Weston Montreal in Montreal, Quebec. What's going on there? Tell our listeners all about what to expect. Well, first of all, any of our listeners that would like to come out and uh, see me speak at the Options Education Day and and join me even for a drink afterwards, uh, please make sure you uh, register. The early bird ends here on May 10th, but uh, it's still a very reasonable price of uh, 50 some odd dollars. You get a, a lunch and a breakfast included and a whole day of listening to some great option speakers talking. I'm going to be um, talking throughout the morning on two particular topics. I'm going to have a presentation on options for uh, managing a portfolio of stocks, where I'm going to really get into talking about the psychological aspects of investing and how we can use different option strategies to control those emotions and and how to do risk reversals and other types of strategies overlaying in your existing uh, investment portfolio. And then I'm going to be doing a second topic called the option acrobatics, where I'm going to be talking about synthetics and the different types of option writing and diagonal spreads and all sorts of other really neat things. So uh, it's going to be a great session held by the TMX Exchange, and I look forward to seeing a bunch of our members out there. And the best part about it is it's negligible cost, only $50 Canadian, which is about what a 12-pack of beer costs (laughs) you in in BC. Not, Not in Montreal, but in BC with the taxes. But Patrick, even in BC, it's still completely free to get a 14-day free trial to big picture trading. You don't even have to give a credit card to prove you're serious. Tell us a little bit more about how people can take advantage of that opportunity. Well, we've uh, been extending a 14-day complimentary membership uh, to all of our Macro Voice listeners. No credit card required. You can uh, come in there and see how we're doing on our S&P straddle position and uh, learn about all of our other market calls in there. Fantastic. And www.bigpicturetrading.com is where you can go to find out all about it. We're going to have to leave it there, folks, in the interest of time. We really appreciate your help in securing the sponsorship that we need to continue to make Macro Voices free. So thank you in advance for all of you who I know are going to do your part to help us achieve that goal. Meanwhile, if you haven't yet, please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. The benefit to you is you'll receive our free research roundup email each week, which never contains any advertising or marketing. It's just links to all of the best, cool, free stuff that we could find on the Internet. Patrick, what can they expect to find in this week's research roundup? 
This week, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview with Charlie, as well as the link to the chart book for Charlie's interview and the charts we discussed in the post game. There was also a, a link to an interesting video with Robert Schiller on what will cause the next economic recession and a link to the Fed's financial stability report, which I thought was really interesting read. And so you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. That does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners, and we're always looking for suggestions suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter, and we will uh, do our best to include it in our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at macrovoices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend and myself at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly Research Roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at MacroVoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>